final round table. Um, given the, the, um, the sort of uh, interest in having uh, more space for discussion that emerged uh, sort of at a side of many talks, um, we uh, decided to, uh, well, after a break from, uh, from Zoom and screens, to have um, a sort of follow-up uh, uh, workshop, which will take place in uh, January. Um, that will be much more relaxed in terms of uh, schedule. It will be three days, three hours a day, uh, short talks by junior speakers and uh, a lot of time for discussions. Um, uh, the title of this workshop is The Limits of uh, Diversity Assembly. And uh, I think you all, uh, you all will receive um, an email with the details uh, to apply to this workshop as well, if you are interested. Um, so I just announced that uh, there, uh, there will be something to follow this, this uh, long marathon of this school. Uh, there is, I, I will also post in the chat the website of the, of the workshop. Many details have to be defined yet, and uh, the application is not open, but you can regularly check it. So given that, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, to thank uh, Alvaro for being uh, here with us for the, uh, his uh, last lecture. So uh, whenever you are ready, please uh, share your screen and... Uh, well done. Okay, um, I assume everybody can hear me well. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so you know, very, I'm really happy to give you the last of the three lectures. And um, just uh, to summarize what we had been talking about in the last uh, two, um, I remind you all that the main question, let me see if I can actually minimize this. Oh, perfect. Um, that the last, um, the question we have been asking is how reproducible microbial community assembly is. And I, I've, been, I've been giving you a few examples um, from folks who have been studying this question in the wild. For instance, this is the, the study that looked at the community assembly in the, um, in the water tanks that form within the foliage of bromeliad plants. And the, um, the take home message from this is that if you look at plants that are very close proximity to one another, it is a natural experiment to study variation. And you find that there is a lot of variation uh, taxonomically at the lowest levels of taxonomy. Um, fewer than 1% of all OTUs are present in all plants. Yet when you look at larger emergent patterns of, uh, of metabolic organization across the uh, communities, when you look at the fraction of a metagenome that is devoted to different metabolic pathways like fermentation, respiration, um, you know, heterotrophy, uh, cellulosis, et cetera, you find that there are, there is a very strong convergent, uh, convergence across habitats and that most habitats contain very similar fractions of their metagenome devoted to the same metabolic pathways. And um, part of, of what motivates the work we do is that understanding this, these patterns of convergence at the higher levels of organization, um, this emerging simplicity that occurs at higher levels of organization, uh, despite the um, large variation that occurs at lowest levels, the species level in particular, um, understanding the ultimate causes of that is very difficult in natural habitats. The main reason is that the community assembly is uh, shaped by both deterministic and stochastic processes, um, and all of them happen at the same time. Um, and moreover, it is often, there's often a large number of um, unknown, even unknown unknowns, right? We often do not know what the selection, selective pressures are in these habitats at a quantitative level. We very rarely have a complete picture of the entire assembly history of these communities, of which species arrived and which did not, were not able to, to fix in the communities. And um, we often lack a detailed understanding of the environment as it's being modified by the uh, species that are living within. Um, and therefore, it is, um, it is complicated to, um, to address these questions 
in simply by looking at natural environments. So what my lab does is we study these questions in well-controlled habitats where we have uh, a detailed knowledge of the chemical composition, uh, the physical properties of the environment, the nutrient composition, at least the ones we add in. And also because these are liquid uh, communities, it is straightforward to even do analytical work to understand what is the effect that the microbes have on the environment. And, um, and we also have control over the ecological processes, the history of colonization from where migrants come, how connected the habitats are. And you will see an example later of how we can manipulate that to gain understanding. So we can manipulate uh, uh, many of these parameters and understand uh, a lot of what is going on. So that gives us an, a, a tool to try to understand what are the rules that, that give rise to these patterns of emergent simplicity in microbial community assembly um, at both levels of organization, uh, taxonomic and um, functional. So um, let's see, uh, the, the experimental pipeline again, so everybody is on the same page. What we've been doing is we do uh, high throughput enrichment communities. We take natural samples, we stick them in, in water. Then we take this, 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 um, this goo and we filter the bacteria out, right? So we get, um, the, we extract the bacteria that live in here. Again, this is the bacteria that were in the environment. We're not trying to culture them or anything like that. Just take them as, as they are. And then we throw them, um, we sample from that very large diverse pool into um, what you can think of as a little test tube that contains the fine synthetic medium. This is, again, for those of you who are familiar with this, M9 plus a given carbon source. And these are carbon limited environments, which is where carbon is the limiting uh, growth factor. And then once we inoculate by sampling randomly from the pool of species in the inoculum, we let the bacteria grow and we typically incubate for 48 hours. And after 48 hours, we, we take us a random sample of cells from here and we add them into a new test tube where we have replenished all the nutrients. We allow the bacteria to grow subsequently and then we apply bot another bottleneck and we can repeat this for multiple days. And it's time we, at the end of each growth period, we do community level 16 sequencing to measure the composition of these communities. This is, you've seen this plot many times. This is the, uh, an example of what population dynamics look like. And, uh, and as you can see, after you know, eight to nine transfers, we find that communities um, reach an equilibrium where community composition changes, changes very little. Um, and one of the main findings we've made is that even in these very simple habitats, we find a family level convergence where if you look, the, repeat the same experiment from the same inoculum in eight replicate habitats, what you will find that even as, as I showed you yesterday in even more, much, many more than eight, and I'll show you more today, you find that at the family level of taxonomy, uh, there is a substantial convergence. And all of these habitats contain very similar fractions of the same two dominant families. Yet when you look at the species level composition, you find that there is a substantial variation from community to community, despite the fact that we are doing the same experiment multiple times. Okay, so I've organized this series of lectures into three, uh, three lectures, right? With the first one, I introduced you to this question and I gave you an overview of what mechanisms could be supporting coexistence in these communities, despite the fact that there's a single limiting resource. On the second one, I, we addressed it, the question of why community assembly is so convergent to family level and how we can explain that. And the answer was that family level convergence reflects a metabolic uh, convergence and functional stuff. What we are seeing, the signal we're picking up by, by looking at this family level convergence actually is reflecting a functional convergence, a metabolic organization of the communities in two guilds. Uh, you remember we discussed this a couple of days ago, uh, one of those gills are uh, respirofermentative bacteria that um, when particularly in glucose, which is the, the case and other sugars, which is the case we've been focusing mainly, um, they specialized in the supplied resource and uh, they grow very strongly on it. And by, as a byproduct of growing so strong in glucose, they employ a form of metabolism that is also wasteful. This reflects a classical trade-off between growth yield and growth rate. And they secrete all of these other nutrients, which are fermentation byproducts, which are acetate, succinate, lactic acid, and, and so on. And those are being uptaken by the pseudomonadacea, uh, which we find in our communities. So the fact that those traits are conserved at the species at, at the family level explains why we see family level convergence. And, um, and, and that was the subject of the lecture I gave a couple of days ago. And today's question, um, what I wanted to focus on is the final 
those questions, which is why community assembly is so variable at the species or genus level. And today's lecture, I just, um, I, I made it a bit shorter so that uh, it would give more, more time for questions that you may have had, not only about this lecture, but also about the other two. So um, hopefully I will finish a bit earlier than in the past couple of, um, the past couple of lectures, right? That's that way by design. All right, uh, so I wanted to start by, um, prefacing this talk by telling you that the result, this idea that this strong family level conservation, uh, despite uh, substantial genus level variation, species level variation, uh, we focused a lot on glucose because that's um, the, the environment that we attempted to understand better, that this pattern is conserved across the board for all nutrients we, we found uh, so far. And this is an example, this is some citrates, citrate is an organic acid. Um, and these are just two examples from two different inocula, each of which was propagated at different times, right? And um, here you have the genus level population after equilibrium for the, eight, uh, for the eight replicates. And as you could see, there are various alternative compositions. Uh, yet in all cases, the family level composition is very similar. Uh, this is another example where we find that different um, composition of the genus level again, and, um, and across these eight replicates, um, yet what you, when you bin the, the reads by family, you find again, a fairly consistent structure, right? And we have seen this not only for glucose, even though despite the fact that today, I'm also going to be focusing on glucose, but I just wanted to tell you that this is not some weird artifact of sugars. We see the same in other nutrients as well. All right, so um, we, I'm, I'm going to evaluate two different hypotheses for why one might see what we're seeing here. Why, why do you find that there's so much variation at the species level, despite the fact that all these communities converge to very similar compositions at family and functional levels? And um, I'm going to start from two different hypotheses, uh, one of which we proposed ourselves in the original paper where we published this, another one which has been proposed recently. Um, and, and actually the two make a lot of sense. But one of those hypotheses is that the reason why we see coexistence of multiple members within the same guild might be due to neutral, neutral processes, right? That it could be that all members of the same functional guild might be equivalent, they might have the same fitness and they're actually coexisting neutrally. So that gives rise to the fact that in some cases you have some members of that guild and in other cases you see other members of the, of the guild. The second, and a second, right, not the second, but a second hypothesis is simpler even, right? Is that the reason why we are seeing different species in different habitats is because we are not sampling all species in all habitats. When we inoculate from the regional species pool, we have a large and very diverse community with, you know, even at very shallow sampling, we're seeing thousands of different um, unique sequence variants. And um, most of them are at low abundance. So it is plausible that the reason why we are seeing that results like, like this is because for instance, it might be that this blue genus, um, this, this species was sampled in this well, but not in that well or that well, right? Uh, or that well by that matter, right? Maybe there is a competitive hierarchy. And the only reason why we see that there's different members in different genera uh, um, of me me different members of, of the same family, different genera um, on different habitats is simply because they, they, they didn't get there in the first place. I mean, it, it is all due to stochastic sampling at the time of inoculation. So, those are two plausible hypotheses that might explain uh, why, why it is that we see alternative states in, in, the, in our communities and we see so much variation. All right, so uh, I just wanted to preface this component and we're gonna test the first hypothesis uh, in terms of neutral coexistence. And I, I'm, gonna go like give, I'm gonna get back to this hypothesis later on, but for, for now, I just wanted to tell you a bit of the work we've done to try to understand uh, to what degree coexistence in these glucose habitats is neutral. And what we would expect if we had neutral coexistence is that, that the frequencies of, um, of the two species coexisting in, in the community should remain approximately constant, or at least don't show any pattern uh, relative to the original inoculation frequency that you add them in. For instance, if you take two species together, right, and you mix them in our habitats and you propagate them in pairwise, in pairwise culture, and they were coexisting neutrally, then you would expect that if you inoculate one at high abundance and the other one at low abundance, uh, that maybe they're gonna remain more or less the way they were, right? There's gonna be, if they do have the same fitness, there's gonna be very little variation over time, uh, or at least as much variation as you will have simply by purely stochastic 
processes of dilution and growth. Um, and, and therefore you would expect a pattern more or less like this, where depending on what was the, the initial inoculation frequency you, you have, you're gonna have that those frequencies are more or less preserved over time on average. Um, if you have stable coexistence on the other hand, what you would expect is that it doesn't matter what the initial inoculation is, a frequency is that those communities are going to end up converging to the same equilibrium, right? And, and they're going to, there's gonna be a strong selection to bring the community to a state where the two are found together. In other words, both species can invade each other when rare, right? And, and that is one of the hallmarks of stable coexistence. So um, if what we had here was neutral coexistence, you would expect that if we mixed species in pairwise co-culture, we, we would see patterns that look like this. Whereas if we had um, uh, primarily stable coexistence between our taxa, we would find that if we mixed the species in pairwise co-culture, uh, they should converge to an equilibrium and we would observe patterns like this. And um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing. I just wanted to highlight that all this work has been done by Chang Yu Chang. Uh, Chang Yu is a student in our lab. He's just an amazing scientist and a, a fantastic person. And we have all been so enriched by his present, presence in our lab and in our lives. It's been a, an incredibly rewarding experience to be Chang Yu's mentor. And I can speak from uh, everyone else in the lab what a, a terrific influence he's had uh, in all of our scientific uh, endeavors and in our growth as people. All right, so what Changyu has been doing, he, ha he's, he has been uh, testing this hypothesis that I was, that I was testing, uh, suggesting before. And the idea is, is, is very simple, right? Is um, he has, what he has done is he has um, um, done a really massive amount of work on isolating bacteria from all of our glucose communities. And, um, and what Changyu has done is this, um, he has uh, attempted to, um, to compete them, right? At different frequencies and see uh, what kind of competition uh, we would observe. For instance, um, he could uh, take the species, the, the communities um, that form uh, in our, uh, basically the, the communities that form in our habitats, um, isolate all the members, right? And then grow all the members in, in, in monoculture. Uh, some grow, some don't, right? Interestingly. Um, and then the ones that grow, what he would do is he would take them and then mix them at different abundances, right? For instance, he could take this, uh, it's a sound like cartoon, he could take one species, these red, these red species over here, and, and grow it at high abundance uh, relative to another species, which is this yellow guy here, which is grown at low abundance. Then he could mix the two at equal uh, abundances, or he could mix the two in such a proportion where the, the, the red species is rare and the yellow species is common, right? And if the two are growing, um, in, if the two are coexisting stably, then you would observe that uh, these three cultures that were started at different initial abundances uh, are going to converge to the same uh, equilibrium. Um, if one of the three were um, competitively excluding the other, what you would expect is that no matter what the initial, um, initial frequency of the, three, of the three species is, they're all going to converge to one of them. Uh, and in this case, for instance, the blue, um, uh, the blue community uh, being um, dominating, dominating the red, right? So the red will go extinct in competition with the blue regardless and no matter of what the initial um, frequency is. And finally, what we have here is um, that if you had neutral coexistence, what you would expect is that if you mix um, the yellow and the blue strains, where, when the yellow is high abundance or where the two are the same, or when the yellow is at low abundance and the blue is high, then over time, the two would maybe be drifting apart. But on average, right, you would see um, all of them converging to the same, um, to the same frequency that you, they had at the beginning, more or less. So um, to test this hypothesis, what Chang did is, is he did exactly this, right? Um, he isolated all of the bacteria in our um, in 13 communities, and um, he was able wasn't able to isolate all of them. Like a, a small fraction of those could not grow on their own; they require their, their their partners to be able to grow in these environments. But he was able to isolate most of them, and I think on average it was about 90% of all the of all the taxa. Um, and uh, he did exactly the experiment we were discussing before. He he isolates all the members, and then, for instance, here he takes the blue and the red, um, and then he mixes them at different uh, initial frequencies. And once he mixes those, he would repeat the same experiment that we had done before, right? So we have done assemble these communities from the top down. And what he's now trying to do is, well, if, he, if he has, we assemble now from the bottom up, are we going to recapitulate the same behavior? And I'm going to also tell you later some work that we've done to basically the same idea of, of, of once we have communities that have been assembled from the top down, we can now uh, reconstitute them from the bottom up and try to use that to understand more mechanistically what is going on. 
All right, so what Chang Yu did is once he inoculated this, these communities, then he, on this, again, on the same environment where the communities had formed uh, in M9 plus glucose with 48 hour uh, growth periods following by the same exact dilution factor as we used before, he propagates them uh, for eight different transfers, right? He inoculates, he lets them grow, and then performs the dilution. He basically treats these communities as if they were the parent community where they, they came from, these pairwise uh, communities, which is only a subset of the, of the entire um, community he got, but he propagates them in exactly the same ecological regime as the, parent com as the community where they came from was assembled. And then after that, he uses colony counting to, to measure the frequencies of the two. And he's been using also some other methods more recently uh, that seem to be in reasonable agreement with the colony counting. Um, all right, so um, what, uh, what Tsenghi has done is he has assembled a large number, uh, around 180 pairs uh, of, uh, of these uh, com competitions, right? From, by isolating uh, bacteria that grew together and were found together in the same community, right? He, this is only counting uh, competitions between bacteria that were already coexisting in the same community, but he's now looking at pairwise coexisting um, of, of specific pairs. And what he's doing is this, he's counting the number of occurrences of each pairwise competition outcome, right? Uh, you could have, for instance, neutrality, which we've discussed before, or you could have a competitive exclusion, which we've talked before, or stable coexistence, which we've discussed before. It is also possible you could have, um, you know, mutual ex exclusion, right? Or frequency dependent coexistence, which are two outcomes that uh, depend on the frequency of the initial uh, that you started with, you're going to end up with one excluding the other or the, or, or the other excluding the one, or in, in some cases where uh, two species might be able to coexist when you mix them at, at high frequencies, but not when you mix them both at lower frequencies. That depends on the exact shape of the dynamical landscape, which we didn't map in its entirety, right? This is just a proxy for what might be going on. So interesting what we find is that there is uh, extremely few occurrences of, neutral of pairwise neutral coexistence in our, um, in our isolates, right? Uh, I think there was only one case out of 186 where you found two strains that are in the same community coexisting neutrally, that mean having very similar fitness. What this means is that at least uh, in the supplied environment, right? Not, uh, not taking into account how the microbiome uh, changes the environment where they live in, uh, but at least in the, in the environment that we supply, when you strip bacteria from the community context and you measure just the pairwise coexistence, you find that very, very few of them coexist neutrally. And perhaps what is more interesting even than that is that um, we do observe uh, a fraction of our, of our pairwise um, coexisting uh, together, but most do not, right? Most pairs that, again, these are pairs of, of species that coexist in the context of the community, but they do not coexist in the broader context uh, in pairwise, right? So they, they require the presence of, of the other bacteria to coexist um, either um, uh, stably or in a frequency dependent manner. And again, very interestingly, we find that neutrality is not observed. So at least in the supplied environment, the bacteria belonging to the same functional guild do not have the same fitness, right? One of them, um, uh, they, they clearly do not, at least, at least they, they, in the case when they eventually coexist stably. All right, so, so far, our, the, the, the idea of whether we are, might be, this might be caused by pairwise um, co neutral coexistence, that doesn't seem to be true, although I, I will revisit this at the end with some uh, results we're finding that are, are intriguing and that we are now following up on. Um, so the second question, the second hypothesis is whether species level variation uh, across habitats could be due uh, to stochastic sampling from the regional species pool. And uh, again, what this might mean is that some habitats may get sampled some species, whereas other, other habitats may not, right? So even if there were a species that was belonging to a guild that would be better, a better competitor than, than, than other uh, species, um, if, it does, if it is not sampled, uh, it cannot win, right, so to speak, right? So that is perhaps an explanation for why we see alternative states. And uh, the rest of the work I'm going to be telling you today about was done by Sylvia Estrella. Sylvia is an incredibly talented uh, postdoctoral scientist in the lab um, who has done, um, I think, the most exciting experimental work we've done in my lab so far. And um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit of uh, the, the findings that she has uh, made. And um, this is the, the subject of uh, a couple of different papers where, where Sylvia is the, the leading author. All right. So, to ask the question of whether species level variation across replicates could be caused by stochastic sampling uh, from the regional species pool, uh, what 
what Sylvie did is uh, we, we realized, right, that we only had eight replicates and that is really not a lot, right, to, to really do statistics and try to understand and get to the bottom of, of to what you for instance, stochastic sampling might be responsible uh, as opposed to other sources. So what she did, uh, we also didn't know, like how many alternative states do we have, right? Do we have, uh, if, we ha if we repeat the same experiment eight times and we see, um, you know, six different states, is that, I mean, and if we repeated it a hundred times, we find, you know, 60 <laughs> or, or, or 80, right? I mean, we, we, we need to know exactly how many states do we have. Um, so to, to nail down that experiment, what Sylvie did is that she carried out an experiment where we repeated the, the one we have described before, but a much, much larger replicates, right? From the same regional species pools uh, of species, we inoculated a hundred replicate populations, like hundred replicate habitats that, that are identical from one another, Again, same glucose M9 medium as we've been using in all the experiments I've been telling you about. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so it's basically the same experiment we've done, but just with 100 replicates instead of eight, right? And only from one regional pool of species. And so Sylvie propagated these communities for 18 different transfers. Uh, and, um, and let me give you a summary of what she found out, right? So um, all of these communities, again, under the same conditions, inoculated from the same regional pool, and they ended up converging to a, a set of different alternative states. And the, 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 there is some regularity, right, in which states are found, right? For instance, uh, she found, intriguingly, that some, in some cases, um, in some set of communities, uh, the only, oops, the only um, guild that was present above a frequency of 1% were fermenters, right? We didn't find any fermented bacteria over 1% abundance in, in those, uh, I think it was about 12 or, or, or 13 of them, right? Uh, which is interesting. In, the, in all the others, we found uh, a, a combination of respirators and fermenters that, uh, that occurred at similar ratios to the ones that I've been telling you about in all these previous uh, talks, right? About, you know, 75% enterobacteriaceae and 25% uh, or, or fermenters and 25% and uh, respiratory bacteria. But now, interestingly, what we find is that uh, we do not find, find convergence at the family level, which is okay, right? Because remember the family level convergence really is reflecting functional convergence, which is this, um, this, this uh, partitioning of the metabolic space between respirate, with this fermentative bacteria that consume the glucose and respiratory bacteria that primarily consume the right products. Uh, and what we find in this case is that only a small fraction of those where we find a combination of respirators and fermenters contain pseudomonadasia, which is this group here, uh, whereas the others do not. And if for the others, the respiratory, respiratory group we found is not enterobacteria, it's not pseudomonadasia, but another um, respiratory bacteria, alkaligenesia. And alkaligenesia, in fact, cannot even grow on glucose. At least they, they, it's, they, they, they're known to not be able to, to ferment, to respire even carbohydrates as a, as a family. But this one that we have here cannot even grow on its own. This is this orange, um, orange bar that we, uh, that we show over here. This is alkaligenes, and uh, alkaligenes do not, does not even grow, uh, at least this isolate on glucose on its own, right? It can only grow in the presence of um, the, the interacteria with, with, with whom it co-occurs. And I will tell you more about that in, towards the end of this talk. Um, all right, so we find that alkaligenes can, can um, um, substitute the pseudomonadasia, right? But as you can see, you see one, or you see the other, right? You do, you, you do not seem to see the two at high abundances. And this is the key, right, at high abundances. I will, I will get, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And interestingly, when you find alkali genes instead of pseudomonas, uh, you find that um, there are multiple subgroups there, right? You could have only alkali genes and this one strain of Klebsiella. This is Klebsiella is, uh, we call this um, uh, KP, and this, 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 this guy you see over here. Um, and, and that's it, it's a, it's a relatively simple community. Uh, but in other cases, right, uh, you could find in this group over here, you could find um, alkali genes as well as uh, two different strains of Klebsiella which coexist with it. And you could have this uh, light blue, which we called KM, or dark blue, which we called uh, um, KP, right? And, and it is in some cases, the KM, KM um, is, uh, has higher abundance and the other cases, KP has higher abundance. But in all of these cases over here, there's two members of the fermenter group coexisting with each other, as well as the, the alkaligenes. Now, what happens in these two groups? Well, the same pattern is repeated, but uh, in addition to alkaligenes, we, we also find um, a, member, a member of the um, uh, common monadesia family, which is Delftia, 
which co-occurs with the um, with alkali genes. And in some cases, we also find here a chromobacter, right? And this is this brown guy over here. It could be found also in some cases here and here in, in, other, in others, right? Um, and interestingly as well, we notice that whenever we find chromomonadasia, it can only be with alkalinesia. We never see it here or here, right? So uh, chromomonadasia uh, apparently requires the presence of alkalinesia in order to be found, right? And now you could have a community where, where chromomonadasia and alkalinesia coexist with a single strain of the fermentative group, which is this K KP strain. Uh, but in this group over here, you could have these two groups, alkalinesia and chromomonadasia, coexisting with both members of the, of the fermenter guild, uh, both KM and KP. And in some cases, you even have a few others, as is the case here, where you have um, enterobacter um, another enterobacteresia, uh, which is another ESV that we haven't really uh, been able to map uh, to any known um, 16 sequence perfectly. So, in sum, what you find is there's a, a, a suit of different alternative states, which are easier to see when you do this experiment in much higher throughput. We have like one, two, three, four, five, six different types of, of equilibria, depending on the presence or absence of species about 1%. This is the, the threshold for this classification we're using. And, um, and what we notice is that there's very interesting, interesting patterns. One is that the first one is that there are some states where there's no respirative bacteria above 1%. We, this is something we hadn't really seen, or actually we had, there were a couple of communities in the science paper that were like that. Um, we had originally attributed that to just, okay, well, uh, the variation we have. Uh, but now we find that it is possible, right? For some, for the, um, the, the res respirative group to not even be there, right? And I'll tell you more about what we think that is in a, in a, in, towards the end of this talk. Uh, and we find a bunch of different groups, that, uh, families that, uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of different groups of, of or equilibria uh, that vary in which of their respirative bacteria they have, whether it's pseudomonas or alkali genes. And we find that when it is alkali genes, uh, it is possible, to not necessarily require, that you will find other taxa there, that it, it is when alkali genes is present, uh, we find that the, uh, Delftia might be there too. And we also find that it is possible for two different members of the fermentative group to coexist. Now, this is very intriguing because in the picture I've been painting so far, which again has been a simplification, is that the, respirate, the, the fermentative bacteria is feeding this, uh, is cross-feeding this, this uh, respirative group, right? But is, here what we're finding is that the identity of the res respirative bacterium influences also the composition in the um, fermentative guild, right? So the, there clearly is some other process that influences uh, some kind of more bottom-up at the family level process where the respirative group also influences um, what happens in the fermentative guild, right? And again, I will give you more evidence that that is exactly what's happening. Again, that picture I gave you yesterday, and I, I tried to emphasize it um, when I was giving the talk, that is a first order effect and we're pretty sure that that, that dominates this effect of, uh, of partition between these two functional groups. But we don't need to take it literally, right? I mean, in fact, we know that all of these interactive that can grow on the organic acids and that they do grow a little, right? During the, the second, um, the last 30 hours of the, of the incubation where glucose is not present. It's not like they stop growing altogether. They still can grow a bit, right? So only the primary, um, the most, is the lion's share, if you will, of the glucose goes to the pseudomonas, whereas the lion's share of the organic acids go to the, um, uh, to, I'm sorry, the, 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 the glucose goes to enterobacteria and the organic acids go to the, in this case, pseudomonadesia or um, uh, alkalinesia. All right, so if this species level variation that you see across habitats, for instance, the fact that you can, in this case, it could be even different, different families, right? The taxonomic variation that you observe, if this was due to, uh, caused by stochastic sampling, then you would expect that whenever you see a community that is dominated by, by alkalinesia, then it should contain zero uh, like it could, it cannot have any pseudomonas, right? Uh, because again, the hypothesis is that is that pseudomonas was uh, is not present because it's not sampled, for instance, and vice versa. Conversely, whenever you get dominated by pseudomonas, then you you, you cannot have any alkalinesia, right? Again, if if the hypothesis is that 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 you have a state because the other member was not sampled, then it, it cannot be there, even at very low abundance below one percent. So we would expect if we plot the the fraction of communities that are dominated by P but still contain A below 1% or are dominated by A but still contain P below 1%, we should expect those to be zero, right? If this hypothesis was correct. And this is what we find, right? Uh, when we actually measure it, 
uh, we see that 67% um, of the communities that contain pseudom that some, where pseudomonas dominates, I mean, 67% of these communities uh, contain uh, alkalizinasia at low uh, abundance below 1%. And I think you can remember the number, it's like 28% of the communities that, con that, that are dominated by alkalizinasia, all of these communities here, well, 28% of them do have pseudomonas. Uh, and, and the particular, this particular ESV, right? Not just one member randomly, uh, of that family, but this particular ESV is present here uh, in, in, in a fair number of these communities, although it is present at low abundance. Yeah, I would actually believe it's probably in most of them. Um, so the monas, um, the, its abundance uh, here is very close to the limit of detection by our sequencing. Um, so it is possible that it's actually present in far more than that, but we're not picking it up because of uh, we, are, um, we are just not counting enough, enough reads, right? At any rate, um, the, the hypothesis of stochastic sampling from the species pool clearly is not, not correct. Um, uh, the, and this is the, the hypothesis that we had originally proposed in, our, in, in, in the paper we published in 2018. Um, the second hypothesis, whether variability may be due to neutral coexistence, um, that is, that is, does not look like it, at least at the pairwise, in pairwise competitions, it's not clear that that, that would work. Uh, but as I will point out at, at the end of the, uh, the talk, uh, some results that suggest that might be kind of true, possibly at least in some cases, or at least might have some contribution to, uh, to, to what we're seeing. Um, and, but again, I don't think, we don't believe that this is the primary, the primary um, um, hypothesis. Now, another possibility, right, that is uh, less extreme than these two, um, is that we could actually be having a situation where the, the where communities can adopt alternative stable states um, that and where we have multi stability, right? Um, we see alkali genes at, at low abundance when uh, pseudomonas is present, and we and we see um, pseudomonas at low abundance when alkali genes is present, right? So um, it, it could be that that they are able to persist in the community at low frequency if the other member is uh, present at high frequency. So we wonder if, if there is a frequency dependent uh, by stability at the level of the um, respiratory bacteria that is what is governing the, um, the assembly of these communities into alternative, uh, alternative stable states. So to, to give a first pass at this, and I kind of a very uh, coarse grain idea was that, okay, can we try to use um, um, the Fokker-Planck equation, right, and, 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 and make the simplest possible model for bistability in this case. And we understand this is actually a, a complex community, that there's, that this is not a one-dimensional system where the Fokker-Planck equation actually might not work, uh, and you could have curls and other, other situations. But uh, given the fact that, we, that the, the, the main drivers for community assembly in this system seem to be these two um, um, alkalizinase or pseudomonadesia, uh, maybe it is possible to at least approximate what we're finding uh, through, through a Fokker-Planck equation. So if you solve, if you solve it, uh, you can connect the probability distribution with a, a dynamical landscape. And what that will give you is the location of a tipping point above which if, if the community, if the, the abundance of a species crosses it, you will see a transition. Right? If you are here and, and you, you force the system, or even by simple fluctuations, the system crosses over, then it will, it will go to another alternative state, right? And the other way around. So um, that was what we tried to do. And so what Sylvie did was to try to uh, take this, this idea to heart. And um, she co collected the data she had from the 100X uh, replicate assembly experiment that I, I've been just describing before, and, and derived the probability densities of the alkaligenasia and the pseudomonadesia in our communities. Uh, we're plotting this in log scale. As you can see, um, this is the data I was telling you before that dispels the notion of stochastic sampling. Alkaligenasia is present um, at low abundance in many of the communities where you um, do not see it above 1%. And pseudomonas is also present at low abundance in the communities where it isn't, um, it isn't present uh, above 1%. So um, what Sylvia did is that she's just fitted this data, this histogram to, to calculate um, this, um, this um, probability distribution, right? And from this equation, she was able um, from the solution of the state-state solution of the Fokker-Planck equation, um, she was able to solve the putative potential uh, on which each of those two species uh, is moving. 
And what this would give us, for instance, would be the location of the, uh, of the tipping point between the two, right? Where, how far could you go? Uh, where basically, where if, if there was a fluctuation that would push a population of Alkylogenesia above this point, uh, would it switch to another state, right? And the same thing for the, for the pseudomonadesia. And um, what then she did is that she tracked population dynamics in a range of these communities. And um, she in particular were, were, was recording, I mean, the, the entire population abundance as a function of time for all the, all the text that we have. Uh, but here I'm plotting the probability, uh, I'm sorry, the, the abundance of alkali genes as a function of time for all the transfers for um, a collection, I think it was 24 different communities, uh, which we chose representing both states where alkali genes dominated and, and those where it didn't. And here, this, this dashed line here represents this point here. And, and this, um, this shadowed orange area, that's the, the um, uncertainty that we have um, in determining what this, where this minimum equilibrium would be, right? And what we find is that by and large, uh, it does seem to be working, right? That, that once the, the alkali genus exceeds this, this region over here, um, jumps over this threshold, it tends to jump over and, and goes to um, this equilibrium. Whereas if it never does, it remains at low, at low abundance. And the same is true for, for the pseudomonadesia, right? Once the pseudomonadesia exceeds this, this, this flat region near the, the dipping point, um, it does go up and, and climb up all the way up to the to this other equilibrium. And if it never does, it might ever um, drop um, to this region of low abundance here. Um, so at least this very coarse grain model um, is giving us a very good idea of where the tipping points uh, in our system are, which we can corroborate through dynamical, um, dynamical um, experiments. So um, now uh, the question is, okay, so we have assembled these communities from the top down, but one of the things we can do is, as I was saying before, is we could now take it apart and, and, and take apart and, and isolate all of this all of these dominant members, we were able to isolate at least the pseudomonas, uh, the pseudomonas that is this genus here, um, these two strains of enterobacteria, and we were able to isolate the alkali genes. Uh, we were not able to isolate the Kumomona, Kumomona the, the Delftia yet, um, and indicating that Delftia clearly requires the presence of uh, alka, probably alkali genes at least so in order to, to grow in our habitats. But we were able to isolate the other three. So, um, we were now doing experiments where we could try to take, um, and by the way, I told you before, alkali genes doesn't also, it doesn't grow on its own in this environment. So it needs the fermenter to be there. So what we did is that we took KP, which is this dominant um, member of the enterobacteria family, this dominant fermentative bacteria. And then we would mix, um, for instance, pseudomonas and alkali genes together at different abundances. And, and then we, that way we could reconstitute our communities. And we would repeat the same experiment as before. Now we grow and then we propagate for 12 uh, transfers. And after that time we plate to count the, the number of CFUs belonging to each, right? So what we were able to do then is we started uh, mixed cultures of pseudomonas and alkali genes at different, um, different initial abundances with um, the same basal concentration of KP, which is this, um, this fermentative bacteria. So this KP is present uh, in, in all of these communities and each square represents a specific abundance of uh, initial abundance of pseudomonas and alkali, just one, right? So it would be here at the center of each of these. For instance, um, here, the, the abundance of, alka of alkali genes would be 10 to the minus one and the abundance of, of pseudomonas would be 10 to the minus four. Uh, here, the abundance of alkali genes is 10 to the minus four. The abundance of pseudomonas is 10 to the minus three and so on and so forth. And in all of these, we also have KP uh, present, right? Because again, without KP, uh, you would not have any coexistence. And uh, as a function of time, what we find is that we did this experiment in two replicates and we are coloring each, each of these squares is orange if the community contains KP plus A both about 1%. Um, it is purple if it contains KP plus B over 1%. It is blue if it only contains KP. And it's gray if when we do the replicates, in one case, you get one result and in the other, you get the other, right? So if in one case, you have that A is dominating and in the other, you have that, that B is dominating or if in both, uh, you, we found both A and B together. Um, so we just, when, when we cannot tell, we just label them gray, right? Uh, and what we find is that uh, the, as a function of time, 
this community converges to um, the, this this face portrait converges to a state where um, every community that was started above this this in, in this orange region converts to a state where a alkali genes will dominate, and every community that would be started uh, in this purple region would converge to a state where pseudomonas would dominate. Right, and here I am just showing you an example of the temporal dynamics for each of these six. Um, six wells, so you can see it, right? So for instance, here, where um, which corresponds to, to this uh, square over here that starts at that 10 to the minus four alkali genes and zero pseudomonas, not surprising, like alkali genes just kind of dominates because there's, it cannot be challenged by pseudomonas. In this one here, you find that uh, the pseudomonas was uh, originally very, um, very low abundance. And then over time, you find that pseudomonas actually went away and alkali genes dominated. Uh, and here on the other hand, at this, at this levels over here where alkali genes was representing these two uh, squares over here, alkali genes started off being low abundance and then it never were able to invade and pseudomonas was present. And the same was true for this other point here where alkali genes was never there, right? So pseudomonas um, in co-culture with KP uh, remains low abundance. And this, these results were obtained by, by plating CFUs and, uh, and, and, the, and the state becomes non-invasible. So um, when we did this is that we, we could take this face portrait, right? And then we, um, we were able to obtain, right? Uh, the basin of attraction in, in the simplified three species consortia. Remember that the, the, the Colomonadesi is not there. None of the rare members of the community are there and there are quite a few, right? We only have these three members, uh, KM, uh, sorry, KP, which is this, uh, so this Klebsiella, which is the fermented bacteria, then alkali genes and pseudomonas. And from those, um, bottom-up experiments, we were able to reconstitute um, the, the basin of attraction for the two states, uh, which, um, which we shade here in purple and orange. And over them, we're overlaying uh, the composition of our communities. This is the, the top-down assembled communities now, um, the, the 96 of them. And you find that there's a group here, which represents the one where alkali genes um, is present at high abundance and the pseudomonas is present at low abundance. Here are all of the ones where pseudomonas could not be detected below the limit of detection, which may be because they're not there, or it could be, they could be very rare and we just didn't pick them by sequencing. This other state here represents the state where pseudomonas is at high abundance and alkali genes is at low abundance and, and roughly corresponds with the basin of attraction that we have, uh, that we have determined, right? It's, it's within the boundaries of the, of the basin of attraction as we determined um, by, uh, by just a bottom-up manner. Um, and we finally have this other state Oh, again, maybe I'm, I didn't show here. Okay, um, and we finally have this other state here, uh, which represent those where you, you might remember that um, that there were no uh, um, alkali genes or pseudomonas above the um, above one percent, right? So so there's only fermented bacteria and uh, above one percent, and it's this group over here. Now, if you plot the entire dynamics uh, on this face portrait, which again we inferred from this simplified three-member community. Uh, results um, seem to actually be make, make, make a lot of sense. Uh, so communities that are started and they get stuck around uh, this region, uh, they kind of wander around this, this white area um, and have a hard time uh, moving, moving over. Um, whereas those that started here, for instance, or that rapidly, um, where alkali genes rapidly went over the threshold, rapidly converged to an equilibrium, as you see in, in these cases. Um, when pseudomonas, um, the, 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 the attraction well of pseudomonas appear to be more shallow, and that is reflected by the fact that you see a lot of variation when you, when you find uh, a community dominated by pseudomonas. Um, and you can also get stuck right in, in this um, low, what we in, interpret as being a, a, a slow, um, a low slope region of this dynamical landscape. Um, and this, this is very metaphorical, I, 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 would, I would grant you that. We haven't really mapped out the full dynamical landscape in a lot of detail, but at least what we find is consistent with that idea, right? That when you get a population close to this kind of separatrix between the two, you get um, slow dynamics that take a while until they, they converge to something, um, or at least it's possible that you, will, you can get stuck in, in there, right? Um, all right, so um, I wanted to uh, zoom in into, into this, uh, this uh, community here of um, this state where there, there is no, um, no, no pseudomonas or alkali genes. So at least they, they are there, but at low abundance. So again, corresponds to this group over here. Uh, our hypothesis actually, and it, it goes back to this, right? Our hypothesis is that these guys are stuck, right? Either this, there is another metastable state that we are, um, that we are not um, resolving here in, in, our, in our bottom-up community, or 
more likely it is that these guys are stuck in this um, very kind of slow region of the dynamical landscape where it just takes a long time for either alkali genes or pseudomonas to, to evade. I mean, if you've seen these cases, for instance, they are both there at, at, at these in abundances and we can pick them up by sequencing um, even after at the end of uh, 18 transfers. It's just that they never quite jumped over, right? Uh, where they are supposed to go. So uh, to test that hypothesis, we, we thought, well, what we could do is we could now um, connect the habitats, right? So at the end of every transfer, we can bring, uh, we can pull species from all these wells and then redistribute uh, across all wells. So that um, uh, if every well received migrants from other wells, it might give them the push they need to, to jump over this, to getting them uh, unstuck from where they are, right? And, and converge to one of the two alternative states. So that's the experiment we did. Uh, we repeated the same experiment. We took an inoculum. Um, and then we inoculated communities. And then we either did, um, we either kept pushing migrants from the regional pool of species, or we pulled, um, the, all, my, they pulled all of the communities and then redistributed bacteria across so that all these habitats are very well connected to one another and then receiving migrants from, from all. Uh, and then we did that for 12 transfers and then we allow the communities to stabilize for another uh, six transfers afterwards. And the outcome is, um, is very encouraging, right? When we did that, right, the communities are connected then that, um, the, the, that, that, that state that is dominated by Klebsiella like KP goes away, right? And then what you find is that uh, alkali genes is able to, to dominate um, and you find them in all the communities. And I would say that in, intriguingly, we find that all of these states over here, they're all over the separatives. They, they all should be converging to an alkali genes dominated state. They just simply never quite made it, right? So um, this is consistent with this result here, which is when you actually allow for for migration, um, alkali genes is dominating uh, and pushing the system in that direction. And we are still analyzing this data to really understand better what is happening. Uh, it is quite intriguing also that once we stop the, um, the that when we're doing this experiment with global migration, uh, uh, we find also that in all of these states, you find both of the of the um, uh, interactive easier. Um, so we, you, we never see exclusion, right? Uh, further suggesting that maybe what, um, you know, pointing out the, the, a potential role of neutrality here. And that's what we wanted to test, right? So th this fact that, that you see that when you are uh, connecting this, the, 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 all the habitats, then stochastic extinctions are less likely. Um, we, we wanted to see if, if, if that would uh, be something we could observe also um, from the bottom up, right? So now uh, the first thing we wanted to do is to ask, well, if we mix the two uh, together, the two fermentative bacteria together, uh, are we gonna see that they coexist or are we gonna see as we see in this state that the, the dominant one KP competes the other? And we have found is that, and, and no matter what the frequency you, you mix them, KP always excludes KM. By contrast, we also find that when you mix uh, pseudomonas with KP and KM, the two fermented bacteria, KP excludes um, KM, and that is consistent, and we see this here, and that is consistent with, consistent with the fact that uh, you never see them together when pseudomonas is present. Yet we find that when we mix uh, KP and KM with alkali genes, um, it is possible to, depending on the initial frequencies, to, I mean, in, in all three cases, uh, we did multiple replicates, which we show here, um, and all these communities, uh, for simplicity, I'm only showing here the ones that were starting at, at equal abundances, um, but they all end up uh, coexisting after six transfers. And um, in some cases, they, they can remain uh, around 50-50. In other cases, one goes up. In other cases, the other one goes down. And this is consistent with this finding here, where the abundance of one or the other could be quite variable um, and, uh, in our top-down communities. And to further cement this point, we, we inoculated, uh, here I'm showing you the, the result of, of repeating this experiment, um, this one over here, where KM and KP are, uh, the three different replicates are inoculated a high abundance of KM, um, a half and half or low abundance of KM and high abundance of KP, right? These this, this two different uh, Klebsiella strains with a part of the same guild are inoculated at different initial abundances. And the result is uh, at least somewhat consistent with a neutralization of their competitive dynamics, which we see is only happening when alkali genes is present. So that led us to hypothesize that perhaps there is this emergent neutrality where the members of the same guild might actually have their dynamic that are finding coexistence in these communities. Um, their dynamics might be more neutral 
um, than you would imagine simply by looking at them in pairwise um, competition, which again emphasizes the importance of, of taking the entire ecological context and the difficulties of inferring what's going to happen if you only do pairwise competition. Um, I'm just here showing you some examples of, of, of the type of dynamics we find. And uh, we are now trying to, to really find um, traces of, of neutral dynamics among the Klebsiella in these communities to see if we can um, validate our hypothesis. All right, so um, wrapping up here, the final question I wanted to address in this series of lectures is why community assembly is so variable at the species and genus level? Um, we have found strong evidence for multi-stability. Uh, we find we can uh, this, um, find very strong evidence against the idea that there is a stochastic sampling is what's governing this. Um, we also find, however, that um, this uh, an evidence at least for close to neutrality between members of the same guild in the in the in in the context of a complex community, which we do not see when we ju we just grow them in pairwise co-culture. Um, and that is that is it. Um, and this is my final lecture. So I, I really wanted to to take some just a couple of minutes to thank uh, the amazing folks in the lab. This is make such a joy to to to. Well, I don't go to work every morning anymore um, due to the pandemic, but uh, I still communicate with them every day. And it's just so wonderful to work with all of them. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it's just it's just one of the greatest experiences of my life, without doubt. So. Um, that's all I want had for you. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the lectures and taken something from it. Um, I'm happy to take your questions um, now. Uh, thanks a lot, Alvaro, for the very nice uh, lectures. So there is a, a question from Silvia. Uh, yes, thank you for the very interesting lecture. I just wanted to ask a clarification. I didn't get the reasonment that you used to exclude the um, stochastic sampling as a cause for the variability. Could you like explain? In yes, of course. So, okay. Uh, well, if it was st stochastic sampling, and by that I mean, um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that that it wasn't. It is not possible that. I mean, of course, there is stochastic sampling. Right? <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that the reason why we see variation in community assembly is not because a species is not sampled at all, right? We just, just don't add it to the, to the well, right? Because if it were, right, in these communities where we have um, pseudomonadacia, right, if the reason was that, um, that you, would, you would have seen, imagine that one, the one hypothesis would be, we would have seen alkaligenasia everywhere. And the only reason we don't see it here is because stochastically you didn't add them to those, to those test tubes, right, where you inoculated. Because you would expect to see zero alkaligenasia here, right? Um, and, and conversely, he, or the alternative would be, well, the only reason why you see no pseudomonadesia in these communities is because pseudomonadesia didn't make it. It just didn't get added to the well, right? So in these wells, you added pseudomonas, but not alkaligenes. And these wells, you added alkaligenes, but no pseudomonas. And when, what I am trying to, to, to emphasize is that this is visually might be something you could think, but if you examine in, in more granularity what is the community composition, here I'm only showing the community composition at uh, above one percent, right? But uh, what we find is that um, of all that uh, in all the communities, um, this is what we would expect, right? If it was stochastic sampling, right? That if you're dominated by pseudomonas, you would have no alkaligenes, right? It didn't get sampled, so you, it cannot be there. Or if you get dominated by alkaligenes, you have no pseudomonas, it, because you know if the hypothesis would would mean that it didn't get sampled, right? But we find that whenever you got dominated by pseudomonas. In most cases, you also have alkaligenes. So both are there, even alkaligenes at low abundance, right? And when you get dominated by alkaligenes, you also have pseudomonas. Again, both are there, only alkaligenes is high abundance and pseudomonas is low abundance, right? So it's not uh, presence, not presence. It's just presence, low abundance, or, or the other way around, right? So that rules out that it was, that the reason you're seeing alternative states is because uh, species didn't get sampled, right? Um, I mean, it's not saying that that could have never have happened, right? It is possible, particularly for some of the more rare bacteria uh, species that maybe you don't see them in some wells because you didn't get them there. Um, so of course that could play a, a role, but at least in the dominant members, right? That the ones that we see are high abundance in the end, uh, they're about there. It, it isn't really the case that um, that the reason why we don't see them is because of, uh, of lack of sampling. I, I think, I hope that, that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, great, there is a question from Miguel. Uh, thank you, Jacopo. Truly remarkable 
stuff, Alvaro. This is a really, really exciting uh, results. Do, during your your previous talk and also during this work talk, you have been uh, convincing us that there are some archetypal attractor configurations, uh, and that that's reminiscent of the of this idea of the enterotypes in gut uh, in gut microbiomes. It's, 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 it's clearly the, the, in, in here you, you show, you actually show this temporal component that is uh, very convincing. Uh, but uh, in the case of the enterotypes, it has, there has been quite a lot of discussion about the, whether or not these are just artifacts, statistical artifacts from compositionality, for example. And I, I just wanted to ask you if you have an opinion on this, on this uh, discussion. From your results, right? Um, that, that, that's a, that's a. I, I, I am afraid. I don't know. I mean, I, I know the literature. I've read the papers, and I know there's a lot of controversy. Um, but I don't feel like I should be weighing in on it, right? Um, I, I think it is clearly possible to find. I mean, I, so on the one hand, it's clear you could find um, artifactual uh, results simply by lack of sampling, right? Um, so it is possible to see what appear to be, um, you know. Uh, discrete uh, groups of, of states uh, simply because you are missing the ones in the middle, right? Um, so definitely the, the, a big reason why we decided to expand in our experiments to, to do 100 replicates, not eight, right? It's because if you do eight, it, you might be seeing things that aren't there, right? Uh, you might be seeing two alternative attractors, but if you do 100, then you, oh, okay, right? Maybe it's a continuum and I'm just uh, imposing uh, categories when they don't exist, right? Uh, so that's uh, a, a uh, kind of that, at least I can tell you that controversy really um, made us, it made it clear that we needed to, to go to higher, um, uh, to do more replicates, right? And, and, to, and to really understand. And of course, the issue with enterotypes as well is that there's so many, the, the mechanisms are so poorly, even if they, they exist, right? That the mechanisms, what are they exactly, right? How do you, how do you pin them down, right? And, and then there's, there's all kinds of questions uh, around that too, which, Beyond the statistical, whether they're statistically correct or not, right? Um, it is unclear, or, or it's much it's much harder really, to 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 know if the reason why we're seeing this is because the the habitats are different, because the regional pools are different. Because I mean, and, and then there's people doing a lot of work that is really fascinating on on trying to elucidate those those differences. Um, and I, I I just think that the the place I see our work is in trying to create the the simplest possible of habitats. To at least get intuition of okay, well, if you if you were to see enterotypes, right, what would be the mechanism that could lead to them, right? And and when would you not see them, right? What would lead to those enterotypes to disappear, right? And that's what we, in some sense, we're, we're after. Right? We're developing a ecological understanding of of what are the mechanisms that can give you different attractors or or not, right? And 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 to give us an intuition for why those might be. But yeah, as for the entire literature, is is a really um, yeah, it's a really tricky uh, thing that I'm really not, not an expert on, on the human gut microbiome. So uh, perhaps I would pass on, on commenting the specific uh, controversy. Thank you, Albert. Great, there is a question from Gabriel. Hey, uh, really nice talk. Uh, I was wondering about the presence of uh, when you're in the alternative state, the, so when you're dominated by A, P is present at low abundances and vice versa. Right. Um, and in particular, I was wondering uh, if potentially uh, maybe phages have something to do with this. So uh, are there phages present in the initial inoculum? And could you do right. these experiments for filtering phages? Right, right, right. This is, this is a great question. Uh, so we now have a, a, a wonderful phage biologist in the lab who is, um, we are very excited to collaborate with um, to address some of those issues. I can tell you that we had someone from, like a really talented um, a, a student from Paul Turner's lab, who's a phage biologist, uh, and came to, to our lab and tried to find phages that could be grown under the conditions of our communities, right? Basically, phages in the communities, and he, because these are communities that form in a, in a defined environment, at least we thought that it would be, you know, isolating those phages in the same environment where <laughs> the community assembled would be um, easier if they were there. Uh, and he tried very hard for a few months and found nothing. So we, we didn't find any lytic phages going around. Um, we still, I mean, I don't know. One question, for instance, could be prophage in, um, induction, whether that could have a, a role. 
And that we don't know. We have not uh, we have not looked right, and, and that could be a very interesting possibility, right? That that maybe um, uh, yeah, just prophase activation might potentially have something to do here uh, with the, the findings. But at least um, lytic phages are not around, uh, or at least if they are, we we couldn't isolate them. Um, and uh, but I, I agree that um, I, this is a really fascinating topic, and and we are now trying to understand better what the role of phages could be in, in community assembly. So this is hopefully in a, in a few couple of years or so we'll have results uh, on that front. Great. Uh, I don't see any more uh, questions. So, uh, oh, there is a question from Tomasa, please. Oh, sorry, hi. Um, hi. Thank you very much for the, for the very interesting uh, talks and I, I was wondering like um, one very intriguing thing that you see that is found is, is that there are a finite uh, amount of uh, stability endpoints in the um, in the last experiments that you were explaining I was yes. wondering and of course you've done a lot of sampling a lot of replication I was wondering if you were expecting uh, fur a further number of um, coexistent points, like of equilibrium points, sorry, uh, whether even a bigger experiment would, would be done, for example. Right, that is a, that is a fantastic question, right? They're like how, how the, the number of alternative states scale with the number of replicates you have, right? Um, and yeah, that's a great, I, we haven't done it, right? And, and, um, and we, we could try to do some verif verification curves, I guess, so to speak, right? To, to find, I mean, once we have the data with hand, we can try to see like how, how often would we be yeah. discovering the states, right? And, and and I think at least that's something we could try. Um, no, that's that's a great question. I um, well, possibly my, my hypothesis would be that with a like a simple environment and and such like uh, finite community, maybe there would be not so many more. Right. But yeah, uh, it's very interesting. But, also apply to other kind of communities, yeah. Right, and, 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 and I mean, I think I was in some sense, well, I don't know if surprise is the right word because I, don't, I didn't have really a, a prior, right? It's funny, in microbial ecology, we don't really have theory. So when, when we're surprised or not about things, it's often difficult to know why we are surprised or not. Yeah. But but at least in this case, I mean, I guess the six seems a lot for some reason, I don't know why, right? But, yes. but the fact we have six stable states so different from the same experiment seems like I don't know, naively I wouldn't have expected that many, right? Yes. Um, but I, I can't tell you why I wouldn't have. <laughs> That's maybe by, by induction on, on previous work. Um, but, but no, I, I agree. I mean, I think it, it would be a, 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 a really interesting question and uh, of scaling this up instead of a hundred to, you know, a thousand, which is feasible, right? No, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a bit expensive, but getting cheaper every, every year. So, so maybe in a couple of years, it'll, it'll be uh, as, as costly as it was when we did this experiment the first time. So, um, but anyway, yeah, no, it, it's it will be very interesting yeah, to, to answer that question. Thank you for, for the question. Thank you. If, if I can, if there's no other, like, if there's time, I have another little questions. It's more of a curiosity. I don't know, Jacopo, what, what do you yes, think? Go, go ahead, there is another question. Yeah, about it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a curiosity. Like I found it very intriguing as well, like the, uh, like the metabolic convergence uh, to the level of family. And I was as well wondering if you had any expectation for other kind of um, communities. Uh, let's say I'm thinking like if this kind of a relationship would change with the rate of speciation. So with systems where the rate of speciation was different, let's say slower or faster. This is behind migration because we don't really have speciation in over ecological timescales, but we could add species through migration, right? Yeah. Right. So I, I didn't have, we actually, this experiment, this is a fantastic question, by the way, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm regretting now that I didn't include this slide because we've repeated this same experiment. In fact, you know, when I, when I talked about this, I think I have this slide here, but I didn't show you the data. Yeah, here. So we've done this experiment where we kept adding migrants from the original pool every single day, right? So we, we kept pushing species in, right? So we, uh, whenever we do the transfers, right, we, we take an, an inoculum, uh, uh, so we, we take the inoculum and, and add species to it. So we grow for 24 eight hours. We transfer cells from the, from the old generation into the new. And then we bring migrants from the same inoculum that you used the first day, right? Mm -hmm. So when we do that, diversity goes up by tenfold. So we're getting like uh, 150 taxa 
uh, coexisting in our habitats. Many of which are at fairly high abundance. So these are not, I don't think these are sink populations. They, they are, some of them reach like maybe 30%. Uh, for instance, we see more axelasia in, in, in these communities here. Um, and, but when we stop the migration, uh, they collapse and they go back to, uh, this, uh, to these states, right? So while we're doing this migration, there you have a much, much higher uh, number of species. So if species keep arriving from, from the original pool, diversity goes up um, massively, but the, there aren't that many alternative states, interestingly, right? And maybe it's because the, the, uh, as, since you are adding these this new species, the, the system has a harder time getting stuck in metastable states. Uh, they all have very similar compositions, right? And then when you stop migration, they all converge to very similar equilibria, right? Um, and, uh, and you have additional families that don't show up here. Uh, and then when you stop migration, they go away. So we have, we have done that experiment and we haven't published it yet. Um, and uh, uh, and I, I think it's, it's very interesting, but we are, yeah, it's one of the things that hopefully we'll be able to put out uh, into the world <laughs> in, the next, uh, in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank, Thank you for the questions. Uh, there is uh, one last, last question from Mathieu that I cut last time, so I feel bad. So Mathieu, please uh, uh, ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was curious here, if I understand correctly, uh, all the links between species, it's purely competitive. Uh, would it be possible to, wh what would it ch change if you now add uh, trophic links to this kind of systems? Um, so you're, you're saying, I mean, uh, just to qu uh, qualify your, your question, there is uh, substantial cross-feeding facilitation. So in addition to competition, there, there is a lot of metabolic facilitation too, right? So the reason why we see coexistence is because of cross-feeding of metabolic byproducts that the microbes create, right, from the glucose yeah. you provide. So, so that's true. So when you say trophic links, you're thinking, for instance, if there were protists or, or bacteriophages that eat the bacteria? Yes. Right, that is also a really interesting question. Uh, going back to the question Miguel asked before about the phages, is something that we are very interested in, in exploring. Like, like, what would be the role of how, how would, would phage, what would phages do to biodiversity? Right, would they uh, promote it? Would they deplete it? Right, uh, there there are these uh, potential mechanisms that kill the winner, where phages that have a sufficiently large uh, host range might be promoting coexistence because of. Uh, uh, selective pressure against those that end up dominating, right? So it might be uh, contributing to, to that. It could also, through lysis, be releasing a lot of metabolites to the environment, uh, which other bacteria could, could also use for growth. So there's reasons to believe that uh, bacteriophages might promote uh, diversity, right? Uh, and as for other predators, I'm less clear, right? If you have protists that are eating uh, bacteria, uh, on the one hand, they, they might also apply these selective pressures against their more abundant, so that, that would promote the, the growth of, uh, at least may, might prevent those from outcompeting the more rare taxa. Um, but there presumably there wouldn't be as much, um, you know, cross-feeding because they would keep, they would be the ones that eat the bacteria, right? They would not just burst it and let it out so that other, other cells can eat it, right? So, but, so they're all, this is a really fascinating question. And I think um, it could be quite easily studied experimentally, right? And it is one of the, the areas that are we very interested in, in moving on in, in the future. Thank you. Great, so uh, I don't see more questions and uh, we are uh, a little bit late. So I'd like to thank uh, Alvaro again for these uh, very nice lectures and you all for